Why, thank you. So I think that's a new feature they added on Zoom as they speak. I know when I recorded my sermon. The last I really couple, don't know what I've done to change this setting. Well, it's very impressive. Though. Thank you. So uh, so uh, we're talking about here Qumran Hebrew, Hebrew, which is referred to as an anti-language. So that in itself is interesting. What in the world is an anti-language? Well, uh, it, this will make sense, actually. So... Um, it's a distinct, a very distinct Hebrew that's specific to the Qumran sect. But before we even go there, let's look at what regular Hebrew would look like uh, in the biblical area and during the period of antiquities. So we have the bi regular biblical Hebrew uh, is divided into the, the standard one we use in the Torah and late biblical he and late biblical Hebrew. On the other hand, is used from the exile. Uh, exile really is 593 is the first exile, then 586. Uh, the temple is destroyed and is a larger exile. But let's say around 550 or so to 200 BCE, uh, you have this uh, later version of biblical Hebrew developed that we see in Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and Chronicles. So these are, these are all books in Ketuvim, which is the last part of the greater Jewish biblical canon. So basically, we have uh, the, the Chumash, the five books of Moses, uh, uh, and the Nevi'im, and the prophets, basically seem to be written in, in the, uh, the earlier biblical Hebrew. It's not really surprising. Language, even people spoke English in America a couple hundred years ago. There are going to be variations here and there. Uh, certainly, there are variations between uh, when you go back even longer into history and uh, between American English and British English, all of these type of things. Words develop. I remember Aaron Augenbrown mentioned to me once that even when he goes back to Israel once in a while for a trip, there are new words in the language that he has to ask people <laughs> what they mean. Often, a lot of these uh, new words really are borrowed English words, but we'll talk about borrowing words also. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the standard the two standard forms of biblical Hebrew, uh, and then we have this Mishnaic Hebrew of the Mishnah, which makes sense. Remember, the Mishnah is canonized uh, 200 CE of the Common Era. It was already uh, these these were oral traditions that were being circulated during the uh, end of the uh, Second Temple period. Think about figures like Hillel and Shammai and then Rabbi Akiva after the temple was destroyed. So uh, Bar Kokhba lived at the time of Rabbi uh, Jonathan, I think that was. I'm sorry, it's, but so words change and you get out words from other languages, but is the script the same? The, the, the way the letters are written? So the Talmud actually talks about that. That that changes to a certain that changes to a certain degree. Not really the letters, more like uh, I'm, I'm I'm hardly an expert in this, but more more like the calligraphy and style of the letters. Sometimes uh, the Talmud talks about. I forgot where was I was. I I learned this once years ago. It may have been in Baba Metzia or it was talking about historical development. But it's not really the, the letters that I think is more of the calligraphy and the uh, like the font, maybe we would almost, almost say now. Uh, I think they have significant changes. Does anyone, as uh, Irene Scott, if, would you know about if this? You look at, if you look at old coins, you can see that the script is very different. I mean, the alphabets are the same, but the script is very different. Okay, so thank you, Sam. So that's, that's probably a good analogy is you, re is you really have these uh, significant changes in script while. The actual letters are still are still the same. Now, uh, just on an interesting side note here, if you look at uh, Rashi, a Rashi script, uh, there you actually have le uh, there's a couple letters that actually really are different. It's not just that they're kind of written in a different font. The actual letter itself is different. Uh, not many of them. Most of them are basically just kind of in a funky script. But you have a few that are different. And does anyone, by the way? <laughs> Know why Rashi script was created? Just as an interesting aside, I think this is some holy language, a holy script Rashi developed. Okay, so the reason it was developed was because it was developed by by uh, people who wanted to fit more words on one page to save paper. 
<laughs> so it's, it's kind of interesting. We, we think of it as, well, this is a holy, this is holy. And if you want to, uh, if you want to study the Mafarshim and the Hebrew, the commentators, uh, Rashi, but they're also uh, often, it's, it's not uncommon for other text, other texts to be written in Rashi. First of all, Tosavot is also, also you have in this Rashi script, but that's where it really comes from. So good question, Jonathan. So uh, we have letters written from Bar Kokhba who led the uh, revolt against Rome. This is not the revolt that led to the uh, destruction of the first, uh, Second Temple, but this is the one in 132 to 135. This is a subsequent revolt. revolt. So, so uh, there's been letters recovered, correspondence, Bar Kokhba. And what they have is they have uh, these letters are written not in biblical Hebrew, even one of the biblical Hebrews, they're written basically in a Mishnaic type of Hebrew. And I'll just give you an example sometimes, uh, Mish Mishnaic Hebrew, for whatever reason, and you really need a, someone who's an expert in the field to be able to figure out why. Uh, but you have, uh, instead of in the plural ending in Hebrew, you see in the Torah, and you see in modern Hebrew for that matter, is a Yud Mem, uh, plural masculine. They'll sometimes use a yud instead of mem sofit, final mem, a nun sofit, a final nun. Why again, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but that's just, that's just an example of how rabbinic Hebrew differs from biblical Hebrew. And rabbinic Hebrew seems to have been more of the, the intellectual, an intellectual type of Hebrew, a scholarly type of Hebrew the rabbis are using to, to, to discuss uh, what eventually is going to go into the Mishnah. And remember, not only is uh, biblical Hebrew more of like a, a language that perhaps was for the lay person, we know that Aramaic really becomes the spoken language altogether. Remember, Jews are coming back from Babylon and Mesopotamia, and Aramaic was the uh, was the spoken language there. So therefore, uh, your av your average person is uh, your average person is reading uh, is going to be speaking. In Aramaic, I know we got into this a little bit last time, and it was Irene or Susan made a, a comment regarding this, but a uh, debate over who really wrote the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and Luke and all of that stuff. And uh, some scholars, uh, and I'm hardly an expert in this again, but some scholars would suggest that uh, these were, uh, though the Gospels themselves are written in a Greek, clearly an educated person is writing this. Um, the original, the original followers, uh, the original followers of Jesus were probably speaking Aramaic, uh, not Greek, just because that's what your average person on the ground spoke. In rabbinic circles, they were speaking this rabbinic highfalutin Hebrew. Uh, people may be uh, speaking Greek as well because of the influence of Hellenization. So here we have this uh, rabbinic Hebrew, uh, but we haven't gotten to what what's going on yet in Qumran, so we're going to get there in a minute. Okay, so uh, so that here it's just Mishnaic Hebrew, which grew out of the spoken Hebrew, differs from biblical Hebrew, as we already discussed. And I gave you the example of the uh, masculine male plural ending. But let's get to Qumran Hebrew, and it's a polemic in a sense that they're coming up with their own counter language or, or anti language, as we said here. Okay, so the sect refers to their opponents, likely the Purushim, that's the Pharisees. Using, uh, using inferior Hebrew. So they're basically saying, we speak a superior version of Hebrew than you do. And this is not particularly uncommon where you have people uh, say, I speak an inferior, a superior dialect of English than you do. And even people do it in a joking around sense, making fun of regional, regional accents from people from other where people uh, people from the north may make fun of a southern drawl. People from the south may, may make fun of the way people in the north uh, speak too quickly and may slur words. So we have mm -hmm. that uh, to a certain degree still. But here, this is, this is more seriousness. Since they, they really think they're speaking a, the correct highfalutin Hebrew, while these other people, probably particularly the Pharisees, who they really want to take a shot at, are speaking like of a very vernacular, common street type of Hebrew. That's the way, at least, I don't think the Pharisees would approve that, but that's the way they see it. Okay. 
so the sect also wasn't going, they weren't going to use a Pharisaic version of Hebrew, and they certainly weren't going to use uh, a common Hebrew at all. Um, it's unclear whether the Pharisees really had really their own uh, version of Hebrew. They may have had a few specific uh, vocabulary. They may have had a lingo, uh, but they wanted a, they wanted a Hebrew that was different, that uh, distinguished them from anybody else. Remember, this is a group who really has very high walls. They're the sons of light. Everybody else, all the other Jews are the sons of dark. We're not even talking about the non-Jews. That's uh, very even more beyond the pale. But so they're going to have their special way of speaking as a way of uh, showing this is insider type of talk. And you have it to a degree nowadays, too, within Judaism, not to this degree. But I know some of you watch Stissel. So in uh, observing communities and different groups, they'll have different catchphrases, which kind of suggest you're a member of the community. You Stichel fans, if you remember, Reb Shulam is always saying Shkalach, which is popular in the from community, which is a uh, slang for Yashar, Kalach, which we say is like a, a good job to someone, like a compliment to someone. So yeah, people say uh, neder, which means without that all the time. So you have these catchphrases, but here it seems to have been much more intense than what we see nowadays. Okay, so they have their own Hebrew with its own vocabulary and grammar as well. And by the way, when we talk about, I'll make this next point actually in a, in a minute or two. Okay. Okay, so this is called linguistic ideology. In other words, there are specific uh, linguistic differences are, didn't grow up by accident. It's not just because we have different cultures and th this is really meant to make an ideological point as I have in the heading of this slide. This is really for polemical purposes. And, uh, and the expressions developed are really called anti-language to say, this is my language, I'm more sophisticated or a better Jew than the Pharisee that the Pharisee who's living uh, a few miles away or in the, a few towns over. Okay, so uh, Professor Redunz, uh, Rendensburg, this is the, uh, the professor from uh, Rutgers who uh, I'm using along with uh, Professor Schiffman for most of the information here, uses an example here where he says in, in the gay community, uh, uh, people within the community may refer to themselves as queer, uh, but, and that's okay, but if others use it, it's offensive. So you, it's, and it's like, it's, it's, it's like the same thing where you could kind of make fun of your own family members all you want. And you may say, people sometimes say really nasty things about their own family members. But as soon as somebody else says something about your family member, you're ready to beat them up. So this is the same type of, uh, this is the same type of idea. Okay, uh, and he also points out uh, criminals have their own coded language as well, different uh, professional groups have their own lingo as well. I remember someone saying they want, uh, they, were, they were a doctor and they're making Aliyah and they said, I speak Hebrew, but I, now I have to learn the medical lingo. So uh, in English and Hebrew, French, Spanish, whatever, there's always lingo when you get into a specific type of field Okay, uh, I'll give you another example. I actually mentioned this in my, uh, my sermon I recorded that uh, rabbis uh, among themselves, sometimes you go to a rabbinic conference and uh, someone asks ask someone else, uh, I'm interested in the, a position at this, Jewish, at this Jewish institution. What do you think of it? So a rabbinic way of basically saying, don't take that type of position, look for something else, is you say it's an Eretz Ochelot Yosvech, it's a land that devours its inhabitants, which of course is from this week's Parsha, when the spies come back and they say it's an Eretz Ochelot Yosvech, a land which devours its inhabitants. This is rabbinic code for uh, don't even think about taking that job, find a job somewhere else. Okay, uh, and this type of uh, anti-language is particularly common in cults, and we're not saying here that the Qumran sect was a cult, but cults also have is very, it's us on one side, they're on the other side, these very high walls. So in any group in which you have high walls, you're gonna have a certain type of language which really differentiates you from everybody else. Okay, so let's look at one of the Qumran phrases. They refer to themselves as the Yachad, you hear the word Achad in here, the one, the singularity. So they come together as a certain group, a collective. They lived a very communal lifestyle, we know. 
So makes sense. They call to, they call themselves a yachad. They're coming together in one ship. Okay, and uh, sometimes you you find these uh, acronistic or pseudo acronistic type of language that gives a patina. In other words, a gloss of antiquity. You'd you'd have uh, you'd have these phrases. With, phrases would come up. They they purposely use old phrases to be impressive and make it sound like wow, this is really old and sacred. When they're just kind of barring a new a new or they're applying an old phrase to a new situation. I'll give you an example from uh, mainstream Judaism or what becomes mainstream Judaism is when someone wants to say that uh, give a, a certain halacha authority. They'll say it's halacha la Moshe mi Sinai. It's a halacha given from God to Moses on Sinai, and it's been passed down from generation to generation. Where in fact the halacha was really developed was really developed later on as the rabbis uh, discuss discuss laws in the Talmud, for instance. I'll give you a very very uh, easy exa easy example to understand. Uh, having separate dishes for meat and milk. Are you going to find that anywhere in the Torah? No, you're not going to find it anywhere in the in the Torah itself. The rabbis come up with this as a safeguard to make sure that you don't mix meat and milk. There, they realize if you're from one day to the next, is this pot of meat that I use it for dairy? You're going to get mixed up after a while. So uh, they say have separate dishes. So as a way of really giving it authority, it's a halacha Moshe. Sinai. That's what they say. It has the weight as, as if God gave it to Moses on Sinai. And it certainly uh, you, the rabbis would argue that God gave Israel, the, uh, God gave the uh, first Moshe. And you've seen in the first mission in Perakei Avot, God's, God gives these commands to Moshe, then to Joshua, then to the, the elders, to Zakanim, to the Anshe Knesset Hagadol, the men of the great assembly. And the point is, this is a continuous chain of authority. And uh, the judges, as it says in, Devar, in uh, Devarim, the judges in your day, you have to respect. Uh, basically, basically, and then the commentaries say, this is it's as if, as if uh, they all have the same weight, as if God, was, uh, God gave them directly to Moshe. That's really the point that's being made here. There's actually an interesting story. I forgot where it's from. But the story is that Moshe is transported in the future, and he sees a, a shiur, a lesson that Rabbi Akiva is giving. Remember, Rabbi Akiva is, uh, let's say, uh, 130s or so of the common era. And Rabbi Akiva is teaching Torah to his students, and Moshe doesn't understand what's going on. And he gets depressed. He says to God, what's happening? Uh, I'm the guy who went up to Sinai and had a revelation with you, the man who received the Torah. And now I can't understand what this later teacher is teaching about Torah. And then suddenly Rabbi Akiva uh, makes a point about a certain law and says, it's a law from Moses on Sinai. And Moshe is suddenly relieved. Why? Because he realizes that he's the beginning of the process Yet all all these uh, all these teachings will emanate from him, and they'll be expanded upon again. Have separate dishes. All of these, uh, all of these type of things. Don't pick up things like a, a pen on Shabbat because you might come to write. You're not going to find it in the Torah itself, but the rabbis expand on all these ideas. All these ideas they flesh out uh, the right, in other words, laws that are derived from the Torah itself, but not explicit in the Torah, such as recitation of Birkat Hamazon, where the Torah says, V'achalta v'savata uvarachta, you should eat satiated, and then after you're satiated, you'll bless. So the rabbis say there is a biblical command based on this to say Birkat Hamazon, the grace after meals. And then they'll make the safeguards, like the pots and uh, pots, the separate pots, as we already spoke about. So the original point I was making was this, this halacha l'moshim yisina is a way of giving uh, giving pieces develop connecting them with the past and giving them authority. Okay. Um, now, there's is, is very few of these loan words, by the way, in Qumran Hebrew, which again really shouldn't be too much of a surprise, being that and loan words means a word from another language or from the uh, the Pharisaic Hebrew, the regular spoken Hebrew. 
uh, we have loan words all the time. I think in Hebrew, there's tons of loan words. Televisia, Mathematica. You can go on. You can go on and on. Most of the modern words they just simply borrow from uh, borrow from English. English has loan words too. We know it's a lot of uh, English. First of all, is made up a lot of French and German. Uh, on top of it, but uh, we don't have much of it again because loaning means taking something from outsiders, which they're not really interested in. Uh, later, the later biblical Hebrew we spoke about, particularly in Ketuvim, the writings, the last part of the biblical Jewish biblical canon, we do see loan words Aramaic, which is not surprising. We have Jews again in uh, Mesopotamia where they're speaking Aramaic, uh, Persian type of words, and particularly in uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel, we have Greek words as well. And I, uh, here's my next bullet here. I, uh, the easiest example is the word Sanhedrin. It's a Greek word originally. We think of it as a, as a Hebrew word, of course, the Sanhedrin, the high court. Uh, last week in uh, Balotacha, when, uh, when Moshe is commanded by God to uh, take his 70 elders so they advise him, it's not called a Sanhedrin. Now, clearly, this is the beginning of what becomes a Sanhedrin, the 70 elders who are going to help in leadership. Uh, but eventually, because of the Greek influence, it becomes called the Sanhedrin. There are other words you could come up with, apikaris, uh, were, 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 words, words like that. So uh, there's plenty of uh, Greek words that eventually find its way into, uh, into Hebrew and uh, really rabbinic Hebrew, because you, you think about rabbinic Hebrew is really the uh, scholarly language during this time of great Greek Greek influence post Alexander. Alexander comes to 332, and we know uh, we know uh, the Maccabees uh, retake the temple in 165, 164, and then uh, about 130 or so, uh, Judah's nephew finally uh, really establishes an independent Judea. But there's still a tremendous Greek influence, and not only in Judea for that matter. If you look at Rome, there's a tremendous amount of Greek influence in Rome where Rome was really the political power, uh, but it absorbed, uh, it absorbed really, uh, and really was impressed to a large degree with a lot of Greek culture as well. I even to the point I heard a scholar once say that uh, Rome, Rome liked to uh, base its founding off, uh, who was it, uh, Aeneas who escaped Troy, if anyone remembers, uh, in the Aeneid where I think he escapes Troy and it leads to the found, mythical founding of Rome. Uh, one of these scholars said, what's the point of uh, this connection here? They were so impressed with Greece, the Romans, that they wanted to connect themselves to this earlier story, but they didn't want to uh, say that Rome was founded from a Greek because uh, that, that was uh, too close, shall we say. So instead what they did is they uh, took somebody from that Greek culture who wasn't Greek, and they say, oh, this, lead, this is part of the, the founding of Rome eventually. Okay, so uh, that's interesting stuff. Uh, updated text here. Okay, so uh, we, we've already discussed, we have manuscripts from the Qumran sect with, which have linguistic updates. Uh, very simply put, this is like taking a text of Shakespeare and writing it in modern English, you get rid of why <laughs> we, we've had this in in uh, in Sidor where people say e enough with these King James type of translations art about UFA that drive everybody crazy uh, in uh, some of the old Maxorium that we still have around. You have this and people eventually want their text to sound like something they would say, particularly the translations of the text. I'm not, I'm not saying we should take the Hebrew, the actual Hebrew and update it, but the translations, people want to sound like a, like something they actually speak. So uh, so we have this group particularly would take late biblical Hebrew and introduce it into text and in standard biblical Hebrew. So they take text, I think we talked about like Isaiah and works like that. And they would, uh, they would put, the, they would have their own version of Hebrew in it, so they're basically taking control of the of the text of, let's say, Isaiah or whoever it is, and making it their own and putting it in a form of Hebrew, which is really special to them. And it also makes it easier for scholars as they find different fragments of the text that they see a text of Isaiah and it's using later. Phrases, uh, 
a sectarian type straight Isaiah, but they were putting their own spin on the Isaiah. Okay. Uh, and they also, uh, they also, and eventually they put the, the Qumran Hebrew into, some, besides just updating some of like works of Isaiah, they put their own, their own Qumran Hebrew, as I mentioned uh Qumran Hebrew I don't want to dwell too long on this I know when you really get into the deep deep the grammar it's uh not necessarily most people at least don't find it particularly interesting uh but an example is uh they would put an a to a pronoun form uh and we'll, I'll, I'll give you an example in a minute and one feature of Qumran Hebrew appears in another text the Samaritans as well uh, would have similar linguistic styles to Qumran Hebrew. So um, here's the example you see in Qumran and the Samaritans as well. Um, so you'd have the masculine uh, pronoun and plural, atema. So it's like atem in plural, like ata is singular plural for a man, and in uh, sing uh, singular for a man in uh, Hebrew. Atem is uh, in plural for male in Hebrew. So uh, they would uh, they would uh, add an A to it, this atama at, at the A, and it would correspond to the positive kima, meaning that is yours. So it's atama, which means uh, you, yours, which is uh, in modern, at least in modern Hebrew, yours would be uh, one singular, shalcha, shalachem, in the plural. That's how you'd say it. So you had some interest, and in a way, since it's similar, we talked about the rabbinic, the rabbinic Hebrew, where in plural, uh, the male, uh, male masculine, uh, male plural, instead of being yud mem, it would be yud nun. So uh, similar types of tweaks here. Not surprising in the sense that the Samaritans would also be interested in some sort of counter language. They may have had the other uh, uh, tweaks to their own counter language. But you remember the Samaritans are a group that felt rejected by the mainstream of uh, the Jews living at the time. They really, if we go back to Ezra and Nehemiah, they really wanted to be included uh, and be considered Jews, and they weren't, and they didn't take it well. And there's always seem, there always seems to be a tension. I think it was A.J. Levine who teaches one of these uh, great courses uh, series. Uh, she, I've listened to a couple of her lectures. She's from Vanderbilt, and she makes the point: the Good Samaritan is supposed to be shocking. We just use a Good Samaritan. Someone does a good deed, or a Good Samaritan is, isn't that nice? It was really supposed to be shocking to the average Jew at the time, in the sense she says it like it was like say, if you like say, oh, the good criminal, the good terrorist. They didn't like the Samaritans, so by saying the Good Samaritan was supposed to really get your attention. Wait a minute, Samaritan's going to be good. How can this be? Because there was so so much tension between the two groups. So again, not really surprising that they too would have their own counter expressions, counter language that would differentiate themselves from the regular Jew on the street. And did they have a more robust uh, counter language? Or did they just borrow some of the, the Quran sex because it was just easy and there and they kind of liked the idea? We're not really sure. Okay, so the next lecture is going to be the Copper Scroll, which is uh, should be fascinating. But let me add that and we'll go into Q&A. Okay, any uh, questions, uh, comments? I have a big white... Uh, Thing blocking uh, Alan and Harriet. So if you have a question, you're gonna have. Don't raise your hands. You're gonna have to tell me. I can't. I can't see you. Well, that's on your side. Well, maybe I'll hit continue. Okay. Oh, I got rid of it. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, any questions? We covered a fair amount of ground here today. No. Oh. Well, I okay. guess yeah. Yeah, uh, so on this language, the way maybe Semitic languages do this, I guess Arabic does as well. We have the vowels are below the consonants. Uh, do the vowels change? I mean, is are the vowel, like biblical vowels the same as, I don't know, today's vowels? Was it just the consonants and the script? Yes, the, the answer is the biblical vowels are, 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 are still are still there. Uh, I mean, and 
I, what does happen is over time, they'll start to get, and certain words start to get mispronounced, mispronounced just because they're tricky. I'm talking about uh, like a kamatz katan in Hebrew for anyone who's familiar with the way vowels work in Hebrew is certain words. Uh, if you if you think of the word, maybe I could write it out and even it's great. I'm writing it out in the back of an envelope from uh, my financial advisor. Important tax return document enclosed. OK, I'll have to pay attention to that. <laughs> Let me get okay. A pen here if that doesn't work well too. Okay, so for those of you who I don't know if you could you could see I have the word kochacha there. Okay, the people pronounce this word kad shaha because that the kamats often make or usually makes an ah sound. So people say kad shaha, but because because we have a shva here, it's it's it, it, the vowel sound is shortened to kochacha. So that's that's something that often gets lost. Uh, that's not something that gets changed as a rule, and it should be pronounced kochacha, but it just gets changed or it accidentally changed because people get used to that vowel that sound making an ah sound. I'll give you here with your word. This one people people usually get right because they're so familiar with, with it. The word coal, kaf lamid. It's, you could read it, if you could see in my envelope here, kal. Uh, I mean, you think it's pronounced kal, but it's pronounced coal because, again, the kamats get shortened to an O sound. So uh, you have those type of things. And certainly a pronunciation of even letters change. They believe that the uh, the vav the vuh sound was really a wuh originally. I think the tebanim, the uh, Jews from Yemen, have the closest pronunciation to the biblical one, and it was really more of a, a wuh sound as opposed to a vuh, as opposed to a vav sound. But the, the to answer your question directly, the vowels themselves don't change, and uh, it's common in these cultures not to have the vowels in the words. And think about it, you, you could probably read English without vowels uh, for the most for the most part. I mean, every once in a while in modern Hebrew, if you're reading an Israeli magazine, I do that, I do that to practice my Hebrew and Israeli paper. Every once in a blue moon, you see vowels under a word simply because you can read a word two ways, uh, and usually from context. You can tell what it's trying to say, just like often in English, you can tell from context what something's trying to say, what they're trying to say. But every once in a while, it can be read both ways, and you can't. We actually have an example from the Parsha itself. Uh, when when the when the spies come back and say the uh, the Canaanites are stronger, Mimenu, which can be read, which is understood as a stronger than us than we are. And I actually talk about this in my sermon I recorded. But it could also be men who could also be understood to mean stronger than he is, uh, meaning gods that are actually saying the Canaanites are stronger, not only than us, but than God. So that's an example of how some uh, once in a while uh, you really can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference. You need to rely more on the context. But again, the vowels were the same, even though the um, the wording and it's really more of the expressions is what's really changing over time. Okay, yeah, good, good question, Jonathan. Anyone have anything else? Yeah, Rabbi, I mean... No? Okay, so... Uh, Rabbi, oh, Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I, I hear a question. not only the vowels, but sometimes the letters themselves had a different pronunciation. For example, the letter ayin. It, and it, at one time, it must have had a different pronunciation. It wasn't silent, just like the Allah. For example, every time I look at the Hebrew, the Sodom and Gomorrah, why it's translated with a G, the I, and should it be Sodom and Amara, which says that whoever heard it at the time they were translated, the I must have had some kind of other guttural sound or something that would make somebody translate a G. So, I so, so I think uh, like in Yemenite pronunciation, there's a very different pronunciation of an Aleph, which is silent, and an ayin, which has a very guttural, it can be almost a G sound. Uh, 
That's and that's so, inter that's interesting too because I gave a talk about this a while back that um, uh, Zeitlin Solomon Zeitlin was looking at the you know the formation of the of the Targum Unclus, which is such an unusual name. But if you that's that's the translation uh, well, in, of the Torah into Aramaic, by the way. Right. But if you look at, we know that Rabbi Hillel's convert student was named Achilus. Achilus, I in Kuf Yud Lamed Vov Sama. But if it on if the ayin was pronounced sometimes with an N sound, and um, um, Lex Vega once said that when he would sing Adon Olam, they used to say Adon Onlam. But if you put the N with Achilus, you get Achilus. So some people believe that Unclus really is a corruption of the Greek translation that Achilles did of the Torah into Greek, not into Aramaic, but yet they applied this corruption of name Unclus to the Aramaic translation. And okay, yet, that's a good point. That's an excellent well, point. And, and there are Sephardi Jews even today. If you listen, they do pronounce uh, they do pronounce the ayin more than the silent ayin. And if you look at earlier texts dealing with uh, Hilcho Kriyat HaTorah, laws regarding the Kriyat HaTorah, it really says you're supposed to pronounce the ayin and distinguish it from an aleph. Later on, the Mishnah Brewer says, uh, which is an Ashkenazi work from uh, 1900 or, or right around that period or so, basically says, well, we're not so uh, medactic, we're not so uh, concerned. And what's happening is people just, particularly in Ashkenazi communities in Europe, just don't really know how to do it, or it's just not a big deal to them anymore. But uh, and I, the ayin is a good example of something that uh, really had a sound, and uh, for the most part in uh, spoken Hebrew nowadays, and, or, or certainly if you go into Ashkenazi, an Ashkenazi type of davening circumstance, it basically becomes an aleph. And whatever, it's just the sound, whatever vowel is under it, gives it its sound. Just like, just like the, uh, the, as we said, the vav really was more of a w, eventually becomes a v type of sound. Uh, uh, modern Israelis. Uh, good. Uh, Alan, I think, said he had something. No. Sorry. No. I, I was. Right. I just wanted to say that in modern Hebrew, when they're speaking, they seem to lose the hay. So it's not high yellowed, it's a yellowed. Everything is an a sound. So there's no ha, which makes it difficult for those of us who learned Hebrew a little while ago. I think Gene Tolpin made that point uh, working with uh, his Israeli Hebrew tutors. Is that correct, Gene? You told me that once? I probably did it one time. <laughs> okay. So I th there I think what's happening is simply uh, when, you, when you speak your native tongue often, you tend to swallow words often. And we do that in English all the time. I'm walking instead of walking. Uh, I want a cup of coffee. Now, everyone just understood what I said. If you're trying to learn English as a second language, I want, to look, I want a cup of coffee. Good luck trying to understand what I just said because I slurred several words in one. So I, I, I think that's what uh, I think when people are, are slurring words there too. Um, even the Talmud, Tashima, uh, come in here, come and learn. You should come and learn. Is really probably, uh, at, at least in the, in the, in the real Hebrew, be a Tashima. You should come and learn. Tashima. <laughs> uh, takes on and it may it's proper it may be proper language in the Talmud but it's like a, a shortened seems to be a shortened up version of the original well, uh, who, uh, I think Alan saw, I saw other hand Susan Alan I think Alan was next no I don't have anything <laughs> wait could someone Alan I think has been waiting patiently could we oh okay uh, who, who was Susan yeah I, I'm doing some textual studies um, in a different area and I'm I'm uh, trying to get at the idea of root, root words. Not, none of the roots of the words really changed. Uh, one of the things that really uh, gets confusing, especially uh, uh, in some of the Christian circles that I'm aware of, is that 
uh, people are, uh, there are a lot of people who stand um, on uh, an English translation as if somehow the English translation is the, is the true and uh, end all of trying to interpret the scriptures. But in reality, when you go back into textual studies and you start studying the roots of the words, you find out that there's all kinds of other things that go into the understanding of the text. So uh, the idea of what you're talking about is uh, changing the language and moving it from here to there has a lot to do with how we understand the, the scriptural text, does it not? Oh, of course it does. First of all, anytime you use a translation, they say a translation is like kissing through a veil. You don't get the, the real substance because you're dependent on the translation. So, uh, of course, translations are great, but they also have clear limits. You're at the mercy of the translator. And often uh, the way you translate uh, betrays an agenda as well. It can, at least. That doesn't always. Uh, but it can. But what? So you're right, Susan. So what the point is that these words develop, like the Tashima, it's even spelled differently than a, a Tashima in Hebrew would be, but we see these trans uh, transitions from Hebrew to Aramaic, yet it's a very Hebraicized type of Aramaic. Uh, so we see, we see the way it affects each other and grows over time. But uh, to really understand what's going on, you really need to read the language as opposed to, uh, or else you miss too many of the... Uh, the subtleties and nuances and, and word play. Uh, again, A.J. Levine makes this point regarding um, Sisra and uh, Ya'el. Sisra is the Canaanite general. He's fleeing, uh, he's fleeing the Israelites uh, under Devorah and Barak. And Ya'el says, uh, what does she say? Uh, Suri Adonai Surai Ali. She's like, she says she's uh, A.J. Levine points out she's purring it to him, turn to me. But in the English, you don't get it. Surai, Adonai, Surai, I lie. It's like, like uh, very seductive, like a cat, as A.J. Levine says. In the English, it just says, turn to me, my lord. You don't get the, uh, the real flavor for the uh, seduction of the text. So you, you miss a lot in the translation. Well, I, I, I guess I, the, the closing uh, part about else? that is that we have we have to be careful no. about how we stand on okay well thank you very much another good discussion everyone let me wish you all shabbat shalom and i hope to see you. uh susan stand on what susan i got lost somewhere i lost susan there from yeah there. yeah mm -hmm. well Scott, I, I did you want something no. susan. yeah well, you you were saying something and you did I get cut off? I, I don't know. But uh, what my thought was is that we have to be yeah. careful about standing on certain interpretations as if they were uh, inerrant. I, I think that was my the end of what I was responding to you about, Rabbi, is that we can't, uh, the idea of Qumran standing in this purest position uh, based on some language issues probably is the point, is that you really have a hard time doing that when, in fact, the the language is not always the same. That was my yeah. It, it makes it, it absolutely makes it difficult when you're using different versions of the language to figure out what's going on. Good point, uh, Scott. Yeah, I remember yeah, going back to Harriet and Jean's point about dropping the hay for in favor of an olive. That might explain. Remember a couple of weeks when we I put up the Hebrew from the Habakkuk Pesher, that phrase, Abit Galuto, the house of his exile, should be hubby with a hay, but they have an olive. Maybe they were doing what, uh, what Harriet was saying. They were dropping the hay way back then and saying, Abit, Abit Galuto, the house of his exile. Could be, because it's very unusual why it, that has an olive, but that could be. It certainly, it certainly can be. I have all these, uh interesting changes that change over time and 
uh, people don't notice it because it happens gradually. But when you go back and scholar study this, it's really fascinating the, the way you sing, the way you see the development of language, the way as we know words take on different meanings over time. Uh, letters sound different. So uh, fasc fascinating stuff. Thank you. Okay, so thank, thank you very much for joining me, everyone. And uh, please join us. Yeah. 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 Yeah.